Hello everyone, welcome to another video from Fantasy Football Scouts. It is, if you're watching this, it is the day of the new Premier League season. Seb and I are recording this uh, Thursday night, so a few, there might be a few press conferences that have gone on and Seb's team might be ripped to shreds, but hopefully not. Seb, how are you? I'm okay, thank you, mate. How are you? I'm very well, I'm very well. I've got to be honest, I'm a bit knackered this week uh i knew you know my kind of first uh, few months at scout and i knew obviously that the week to the build-up of the season would be a pretty big one i think i underestimated how big a one it would be it's been a lot <laughs> it's been a lot of stuff a lot of streams a lot of stuff with sponsors a lot of stuff with you know internal stuff getting the transfer planner set up and everything but yeah i think things are things are good and people seem happy so I think I've done an okay job so far. I don't think oh, you've, done, you've, done, you've done you've done a brilliant job. Unless okay. this goes out without sound, in which case you know, <laughs> which is which but... is a strong possibility. <laughs> to be honest, if, if there's no sound, I'm still going to upload this video anyway, and they just have to work. They can see a team. They probably don't want to listen to us anyway. Uh, yeah. so it's all fine. Um, so Seb, you've got the honour of being the final team reveal of Fantasy Football oh, no. Scouts. I know, so it better be a good one. I'm hoping not to see a load of template picks. I'm getting sick about talking about some of the players. I have to be honest. I've seen a sneak preview of your team, and I think we've got some quite interesting things to to talk about um just for anyone who's watching this now we've done loads of team reveals over the last few weeks obviously the ones that were done a few weeks ago uh team reveals might be a bit of a stretch i'm aware of that but i still think there's some interesting things and there's some strategy from some of the top managers as well check out my video with tom freeman and joe over the last few days who've got amazing records and you know some of the insights they've got about the game and things that are really good and so no pressure seb you're following on from two veteran managers with great records so i'm looking forward to hearing uh some stuff from you um, just before we get into the video, I just want to talk about Bundesliga because it's quite exciting. Fantasy Football Scout have now got a partnership with the Bundesliga game. So we're going to be doing articles for them. We're going to be doing promotions for them. Uh, they're really keen to get the game out to a kind of a wider audience and everything. So if you're interested in the Bundesliga... Uh, or if you want to be interested in the Bundesliga, then fantasy football is kind of the perfect way to, to do that. Uh, you, you, you like the Bundesliga, don't you, Seb? I do, I do. I quite enjoy following it. Probably outside of the Premier League, now that Leeds mm. have got promoted. Outside of the Premier League, it's probably the most enjoyable league to follow and watch, both because of the quality of the football. Admittedly, Bayern run away with it, but then, you know, what league doesn't that happen in? Yeah. But the rest of the league is suitably competitive, and we know it's pretty pretty attacking, which is good for a fan, right? Yeah, absolutely. And what, what gets me is, you know, I, I don't like it when a player signs, like Sancho signs, and I know a bit about Sancho, but I've never really seen him play. I don't know, you know, you talk about the eye test and stats, and I know you're, you're obviously a, bit, a big stats man, um, but obviously it's, it's you don't like, I don't like signing a player when I've never seen them at all. And, you know, we've got Gaffer this year, uh, which is the championship, which I'm really interested in playing because I'm going to actually learn a bit about the promoted sides next season and know a bit more about them. And I'm going to try and watch a few more games. But also like the likes of Timo Werner, for example, and Havertz coming over and Sancho, these are all big signings. I only see play in the Champions League on, on the on the times I watch. So I really want to play Bundesliga. And I think to be a better fantasy manager, I think you need to play more fantasy games and learn more about different players and how they perform in these types of things. So I strongly recommend you give it a go. I mean, it's like anything, isn't it? You can you can read about it, you can look at stats even, but there's something different to actually playing a thing, getting your hands on it. I don't know if you're learning an instrument, you could watch as many videos as you want, but you need to actually give it a go. It's probably the same with fantasy games think, to a, I, less, a lesser degree, right? <laughs> yeah, just like playing the piano uh, is, is, <laughs> is a feel, definitely. Yeah, and yeah, I, I just think it's, you know, you, you need sometimes you need that competition as well to keep you motivated and to get you watching it. And, and there's a Fantasy Football Scout League, so there's a code for that in the description. Uh, yeah, and you've got, if you're watching this, you haven't got long to sign up, so make sure you do it quickly before Gaming 1 starts. Uh, right, on to the video. So I've got your history up on the screen, Seb. It's pretty good, I have to say. Very solid. You seem to be a manager who kind of dips up and down, I'd say. You're you're you're, you're quite I'd describe you as a fairly volatile fantasy football player. You're hitting, you know, 5k rank, you know, uh, a 3,000, then an 87,000, then a 1k, um, and then, you know, an 11,000, then 107,000, then back down to a 14,000, then a 300, and then up to 137,000 again uh, last year. What was the deal with that? How, why do you think it kind of, I mean, they're all, you, know, you haven't had a bad rank really until since 2008. Every rank has been fairly solid, but why do you think it, it kind of fluctuates so much year on year? I mean, some of the standard excuses for want of a better <laughs> word, you know, when you take it seriously, you don't take it seriously. I'd say until like started doing these things about a year ago, which is uh, which is all good fun. But until then, I was much more about mini leagues than I was right. overall rank to the point where I did not care about overall rank. So I, my family mini league and a couple of work mini leagues, I tended to win those. 
Um, I've only lost our family one once in about a decade, including including last year, ridiculously, which is probably quite <laughs> lucky. Um, so I'd always focus in on that. And that can obviously, of course, if you finish number one overall, you're going to win your mini league. But when it comes to the end of the season, you know, you're targeting moves. Mm. We trying look at to, trying to block people or, or trying yeah, to get exactly. a different player. Yeah. We look at effective ownership when we're looking at the whole game. But when you're in a mini league, you really, you know, effective ownership is three, four, five, even a dozen people. Mm. You really can pinpoint players to, like you say, block or attack certain positions, which can be detrimental to your overall rank. But as long as you're relatively keeping your distance from the other people in your league, it can work out. Um, but I mean, you know, everyone has those. Oh, I wasn't playing properly. Or I was going for this. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to excuse any of those ranks. There's some good ones. There's some poorer ones. A couple of interesting ones around. So in 2012-13, um, I wish I'd finished 3,000th. I didn't take a hit all season. So I spent the entire year just doing one transfer a week. And that was a conscious, a conscious strategy, yeah, was it? Yeah. decided before the season. It's not, obviously, that's not enough of a sample to say that's how you should play the game. But I learned, you know, about how I want to play the game, what I have to do in that situation. It was an interesting approach. I guess you'd say that a good start is much more important if you're mm. taking that approach. And then in the following season, I did the opposite. I took a hit every single week. Interesting. And that, that took me to 87,000. Again, doesn't mean that, you know, the not taking a hit is better just because the rank is better. There could have been so many other factors in that. But I definitely found the latter a lot more stressful and kind of felt myself like looking for moves and trying yeah. to keep my team moving, which probably hurt more than it helped. That's really interesting. I think it's rare to, to see like a, you know, a kind of a, a, a dedicated FPL manager who's willing to do those kind of experiments with, with their own team. Um, I'd love to try and do something like that, but I think I'd fall into, there'd be a week where I've got three injuries and I'm like, no, I've got to take a hit this week or, or you know, or, you know, something like that. And it would kind of, it would test my, my resolve too much. So yeah, it's really, really interesting that you've, that you've done that. Would you, would you say now that you're doing stuff for Scout and you're a bit more involved in the FPL scene, you, you, you kind of, you care more about overall rank then and less about the mini leagues? <laughs> Yeah, and then I finished 137. Times. Yeah, it's always the way, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. It's a good thing I got that 389 a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. um, it's certainly, it's like, it's more of a, I guess it's kind of what people are judged against, rightly or wrongly. You know, it's the one number we've got to rate if people are any good. Mm. We were talking just before we went live that actually, I kind of feel like consistency. So more than getting one high rank or something, or even a couple of high ranks, consistently finishing, say, in the top 100K, like Joe has. Mm. is arguably more impressive because there's so much variance across seasons, both in terms of how we interpret football, but also just literal luck of a player getting injured halfway through a match that you've captained them or something. Yeah. I feel like being able to consistently hit the high ranks shows that you've got a skill set that is suitable to FPL and also adaptable to the various seasons we yes. see. And to be fair, maybe I, looking at my ranks, to go back to your first question, maybe that's what I don't have. I'd say putting all those things aside, like, you know, trying to beat my brother or taking the last three weeks of the season off and forgetting to use my triple captain, which I did one year, putting all of those <laughs> aside, I think last year probably threw me. Like Leeds mm. got promoted and I didn't really know what to do with that. And COVID, I probably didn't deal with that as well as other managers did. Um, I very much can get something I try to not do, but I very much can like sort of fall into, I guess, patterns. So hopefully this season, if it's a bit more of a normal season, you know, you use your wildcard at a certain time, you look for fixture swings, we treat Christmas, mm. you know, with the heavy heavy period there maybe i'm a bit better at that because over years i've you know got those patterns of how i respond to those times in the game the types of moves that work for me the things to look for so maybe we'll find out but i'm hoping for a better season yeah absolutely. i mean last year just didn't suit my style of play at all I, I always look for ways to you know beat the template and try and get in a few differential picks and ignore go against effective ownership and all that kind of stuff which has done me okay sort of in the past but last year was just so much if you if you try and deviate, if you try and be different, you get punished instantly and brutally, and you can't recover from it at all. So yeah, there was there was lots about last year, and, and you know lots of top managers struggled last year. I mean, look at late riser for example. You know, finishing sort of six seven hundred thousand. He's never been anywhere near those those kind of ranks. And you know, there's there's lots of people I see. You know, Tom Freeman for example managed to just claw his way into the top hundred thousand sort of in the final few days. I mean, me and him were four hundred thousand with about you know six seven weeks to go, and he, he managed to make it. So yeah, if you're listening to this and you've had a bad season last year i think yeah give yourself a bit of a break last year was we're not going to see that we're not going to see that again just to just to highlight you beat me by one point last year as well thank you for highlighting that. i did i didn't want to mention that i didn't want to mention that yeah, yeah we, had, we, had, the, we had a bit the, of a battle the going scout on. cast got one point worse, one point worse. <laughs> we had a bit of a battle going on didn't we towards the end <laughs> uh yeah it was good how do you think this season's going to pan out do you think um i mean mark and i were talking on black box the other night about the home advantage coming back and obviously fans being back in the stadium i'm predicting there to be more, more of a swing towards home 
home wins uh, this this year because I think that is going to be a huge factor for teams. And last year, with you know, we saw more wins for away teams but on the back of it. I think we might we're going to see that even more reversed. What's your what's your feeling about it? Are you looking forward to fans being back in the stadium? Oh yeah, very much so. Go back to Ellen Road, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but I think in terms of, I guess in terms of actual football we'd probably see the response you would expect. You know, home becomes more of an advantage, mm. away becomes a bit tougher. Maybe even more so at first than usual, because I'd imagine if you think of it like maybe, I don't know, an elastic band or something, where in the past, you know, home and away has always been a similar sort of ratio of advantage and disadvantage. Because we've not had that for so long, I wouldn't be surprised if rather than, you know, going back to where it used to be, it would fling back the other way because we've pulled yeah. it over here. It'll sling back over there. And there might be even more of an advantage for home teams, at least at first, until we settle back to that norm yeah. that we've seen over the past you know, 20 years. That's what I think. And it's, it's quite interesting as well, because I, I looked at my team um, earlier today and I've got two players playing at home. <laughs> so I'm predicting this big home advantage for teams. And actually, in the first week, I'm barely going in with any. Uh, so that's, that's, that's interesting, though, because I think in terms of like real football, I think it's a big thing. But in FBL, there's an example. No, I won't, I won't get this perfectly right, so excuse me. But there was an example I remember seeing from a few years ago where if you looked at Salah and Mane... It was going into a new season, looking back at the previous season, I think Mane had been a lot better at home right. and Salah had been a lot better away. So people were going into the season going, okay, well, that's how I'll do it. You know, I'll switch between them or that's how I'll captain them. In that coming season, it then completely flipped. Mm. Salah was better away and Mane was better at home or whatever the reverse was. So you would have got it completely wrong. And then if you actually looked at both players next to each other, both of them did better at home in both seasons it was just when they were compared to each other that yeah. there was that uh, disparity. So I guess when we're looking at like a team's overall performance, sure, we'd expect the home team to do better. But you could lose 6-1. If the one is your striker, then you're probably still good in yep. FBL. So of course it matters. But I feel like there's a slightly different angle to approach it from from FBL as opposed to just, you know, who's going to win a match. Yep, absolutely. I think what's interesting is, is teams like Everton and Burnley, who had such a poor home record last season, how they how they change. And I, I think particularly with Burnley, really interesting. So I wonder how Dyche is going to set them up because they're so attacking and gun ho towards the end of last season. I wonder if they're going to revert back to a more, you know, make turf more fortress, you know, get the defensive numbers back and, and things like that or whether we're just going to be like no do you know what Chris Wood's going to be David Villa we're going to Brown Hill was messy we're going to really go for it every every week so yeah I'm, I'm I'm really looking forward to it I think it was Chris that pointed that out this out that he said what you might expect is however a team plays maybe that won't change but they might go more towards that extreme mm. depending on you know what the crowd expect so Everton say they're playing Man City at home the fans are probably absolutely fine with them sitting back and trying to defend in fact they might even quite enjoy that you know cheer every tackle yeah it's true but if they're playing Burnley at home, maybe they'll be less for that and they'll want to see more attacking. Yeah. So again, it might sort of like push what we had last year just slightly further in each direction. Yep, I think I think it is. I think your elastic band analogy is bang on the money. Uh, right, without further ado, let's bring up your team. So to run through your players, you've got... It's an interesting one. I mean, I think it's I think it's the first 4-3-3 three, three that I've, I've done as a presenter of... Team reveals. Is that a thing? Maybe it is now. Um, Sanchez and goal. Uh, Trent, Dean, Shaw, and Simakas. Uh, Salasson, Mares, and then Antonio Wilson makes the, it makes the eleven. And Watkins, who is very interesting as well. And on your bench, you've gone for uh, Rafina on your bench. Interesting. Amity and Brownhill. So let's. Uh, we tip, tend to start at the back with these things. So you've gone four at the back. Do you, do you typically play four at the back or are you mostly a three at the back type manager who's experimenting uh, a little bit I'd this year? Probably normally be three, but I guess rather than rather than overly focusing on formations, I guess I'd rather look at the players yeah. and thus what formation that forces me into. But I guess we all do that. You know, that's not particularly insightful. We all do that and we fall into naturally wanting midfielders or attackers. Um, I guess overall, just a quick thing to say on the team is while of course, you know, calling it a team reveal, I'd probably have about three in my head that I might end up with a thing I'm trying to avoid. No, no, doing. so we're not allowed to say that. It's it's a locked <laughs> in locked in team reveal, I'm afraid. It's uh <laughs> Yeah. Um but I would say like I have like probably about three in my head that I've sort of been drafting over preseason. Uh this one doesn't have Fernandez in on the scout cast. I had one that did have Fernandez in. And I also had a sort of Harry Kane big striker version, but that might not be uh, mm. viable for the beginning of the season now. Depends on Lukaku. Um but what the reason I've done that is I want to try and avoid Say, say I built this team and then I went, oh, do I want Danny Ings or should I have Torres instead of Mares? How do I squeeze Fernandez in? Rather than doing that and spending, you know how it is, you know, half an hour to the mm. deadline and you're trying to find that 0.5 million, 
I want to have three drafts in my head that I just pick between. So of course there might be a few tweaks and this one, you know, recently had Simakas brought into it, but I want to maybe be a bit chill and just go, no, no, I'm going with draft day. I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm putting that plan into place. Say Bruno Fernandes gets injured. Well, I've got a, you know, I've got a non-Bruno draft ready to go. The reason I'm sharing this one is I think it's the one I prefer at the moment, mm. which is the, the no Bruno one. Um, but yeah, back to back to the defence. I think it's probably four, if I'm honest, because Simakas has come in. Yes. You see Rafinha on the bench there. The way I've kind of treated that is I was always going to have two 4.0s if I could get away with it. Suddenly, one of the 4.0s has got Norwich on the first day and he's playing for mm. Liverpool. So I would have started Rafina, but I reckon Simakas possibly has a slightly better points potential for the opening day. So instead, I'm happy to start him, have Rafina on the bench. And then when the time comes that Simakas loses his place, I either transfer him out or I've got a player on the bench ready to go. So it's actually a 3-4-3, three, three, just one of my 4.0s is Happens suddenly a play. very viable option. Yep. So, t- so two questions there then. I mean, firstly, are you worried about Simakas after game week? Let's say, well, let's say you don't play him in game week three because he's got Chelsea and then Robertson maybe comes back in after the national break. Are you worried that that locks you out of potentially moving for a Mane or a, or a Jota or are they just not players that you really think are going to be a big a big deal? It's kind of the question. It's just the question that I'm kind of asking everyone because I think I, I, put, I put a tweet out earlier and, and I was just amazed with how uh, how passionate Simakas' is. Um, followers are these days they're like you, you can't say anything bad about him or, or you get absolutely <laughs> absolutely slated so i'm just wondering where, where you sit i mean he, he's a gem but he's a gem for a limited period of time right yeah i mean i think you're right it's that's the clear and obvious thing that we can only have three Liverpool players and um one of them therefore can't be mane or jota for example who i had in my team the other day i kind of feel like i'm trying to keep it as simple as possible i've been given the chance to have a starting we hope we assume liverpool left back who does have some attacking potential with a couple of very good fixtures for a very cheap price. Mm. I should just take that. Like, I know it might cause me a couple of issues in the future, but I don't think I was going to have triple Liverpool for all that long. If it, if it was uh, Diego Jota I was going to have, I think I'd probably move him on for similar reasons. He would probably lose his starting spot. Salah and Mane wouldn't stick around for long. I like um, Andy had a Mane draft the other day on the scout cast, which I really liked, but his plan was to bring in Fernandez after a couple of weeks. Yeah. So if it's two or three weeks that I'm looking at, a 4.0 Liverpool defender just feels like a gift horse I shouldn't look in the mouth. Yep, interesting. I mean, the other thing, though, is obviously you've got Amity there as well. So when Rafinha does eventually come in, you're going to be rocking with two 4 million non-playing defenders, most likely, because Vestergaard's yep. about to sign for, for Leicester, probably has signed by the time this video goes out. Yeah. And so you're going to be just, you're, you're going to be brown hill deep. And that sounds very wrong, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Uh, is that something, because I mean, the bench is something that concerns me. It's, it's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm kind of fluctuating between a 3-5-2 a, a and a 3-4-3, uh, a three, three, but I'm leaning towards a 3-4-3 now because I, I'm just a bit concerned I'm going to need to use that bench at some point. Is that so a concern I, for you? I mean, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't, but I firmly believe that in game week one, we have the least amount of money we're probably going to have all season in terms of value mm. and the least amount of information. I want to get all my money in the team where possible. And if one week I miss out on a couple of points because I don't get a 4.5 off the bench, you can see I get a 4.0 it doesn't play. I feel like in the long run, I come out on that. I can, I come out up on that, even if it feels bad in that one week. Obviously, the one caveat that with that being if we get another season disrupted by COVID, I, of course, need to address that. Mm. So last year, we're talking about you know, why I did poorly last year. Maybe that was one of the things. But in the past, I've always been an advocate of a really cheap bench. You don't get points from your bench very often. And when you do, I'd imagine it's not, you know, you get one or two players deep. You mm. rarely go three. And it's often not going to be, it's not like you've got a Fernandez on your bench. There's a few players, you know, we've had our, um, uh, oh, goodness, who was the Burnley player? It's completely slipped my mind. George Boyd. George Boyd, yeah. Yeah, so he was brilliant. Everyone had him. Kapu, he was cheap anyway. Remember Kapu back in the day? I do remember Kapu. I started, <laughs> I started him, actually. Yeah. But I mean, but they were. I think they were pretty much the cheapest you could get anyway. Mm. So unless we're presented with one of those gems, I'm pretty happy having a cheap bench. Now, of course, I know I've got Rafina there, but if you like, Simakas is my cheap bench. Yeah, exactly. I just think he's they, a better bet than Rafina they, to start. Just I guess the thing is, with, with two four million defenders, you run the risk that if a defender doesn't start, you get no one. So obviously Brownhill can yep. come on for one of the front line, but you, you don't have that. So I've always liked to have one. If I'm going to prioritise a defender, I would prioritise a defender because, uh, sorry, if I'm going to prioritise a, a, a bench player, it's going to be a defender because I know that I'm going to get that player on regardless. Whether it's a midfielder and I don't get my defender on, you know, then I don't, I don't get them. Uh, so yeah, I think you're running, you're running a bit of a risk 
um, with that. But you've got three defenders who should play every minute. You've gone quite, you've gone quite a lot. You've got quite a lot of money invested in defense. So let's talk yeah, about that's, Dean. That's, I thought, well, that's kind of the thing. I like if I'm going to use my transfers, and I'd like to use my transfers mm. really aggressively this season. Like I will happily take two hits in game week two or three if I have to. That's something I want to try and do. But if I can keep those transfers to the forward line, especially a bit of an injury-prone forward line there, Alexander Arnold, Shaw, and Dean you could probably hold on to for the entire first half of the season yeah. if you wanted. Um, and sure, there might be marginal gains to be made, but I like that idea of just having a defence I can set and forget. Uh, and you mentioned, mentioned Dean. I think Alexander-Arnold and Shaw are pretty obvious. I did have Robertson and Philippe injured in place of Shaw. And you got um, more money in defence then. You really, you really did. Yes. I, I quite like, I really like that double up of Alexander-Arnold and Shaw. Um, I think Robertson, Alexander-Arnold and Shaw, uh, Trent and Robertson, sorry. Uh, I think Robertson probably offered a bit more benefit than Jota in terms of mm. even if Jota ended up scoring in per minute, Robertson plays every match. But I've moved, I've moved him down to Shaw who presents a similar sort of thing. I know you don't have Shaw, but I think just uh, trying to look at it as objectively as possible. He's got great numbers, plays for a good defence that should improve. Sure, if he gets injured, uh, no pun intended, I'll try and throw him out. But <laughs> while he plays, he's nailed. So I'm pretty happy with that. Oh, but now. believe me, I'm, I'm not sat here saying I think Shaw's a bad pick. I have, I've never said that. It's it, you know, it's sometimes just I, I wanted to take a bit of money out of my defence, and and I'm, I'm happy. Oh, with, I'm happy with Sufal. So I, I, I think, you know, if if Shaw completely blows Sufal out of the water, you know, by 20 points over the first few weeks, then okay, I've got that completely wrong. But I, I like Sufal's underlying numbers. I like the fixtures for him. Oh, he's um, got like nine assists last year. Yeah, well. nine and assists. Is, arguably, should have scored some goals as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Remember the one where he threw a goal and hit the post? Unbelievable. Mm. I think I think it happened twice as well last, last season. Um, the reason I mentioned Dean is just because Dean was like locked in everyone's team. Like at the start of the season, it was like, oh, Benitez is in. He's a nice defensive manager. He's going to push Dean forward. He's going to be all the set pieces because Rodriguez is going to leave and Sigurdsson, let's not talk about him, but we know what's going on there um, and all that stuff. But gradually I've seen him in less and less teams to the point in which this is the first team I've seen with Dean in, in a long time. You're keeping the faith with him then. Yeah, I wonder if people are just talking themselves out of it. I so maybe he's slightly less attractive. And hey, if I had to find 0.5 million later, which we might discuss with trying to get Danny Ings, mm. absolutely Dean could become Sufal or someone like that. But I had Calvert-Lewin until we weren't sure about him. Because if you look at Everton's fixtures, okay, I, well, I really like Rafa Benitez as a manager, but I know some people are less sure. But if you just look at their fixtures, they're so nice for so long. Mm. I want to use my transfers aggressively, but not unnecessarily. So I will flip Mares and Son and Fernandez and Antonio all over the place. But if I can just have an Everton player or two Everton players at one point that I can hold on to for 10, 11, 12 weeks, that's pretty attractive for me. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think people have gone off him because the preseason has been really poor. Calvert-Loon's been injured and they're, th you know, you, 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 we think of Dean, he's going to whip some balls in and like him and Townsend are going to be crossing balls in for what, Damari Gray, <laughs> the smallest player I think in the league uh, and, and maybe even Rodriguez, the two players who you're not expecting to get much here. So I think, you know, Calvert-Loon needs to be fit. I think he's back in training today. I wonder if he's going to start at Southampton, but he, he's in line. I wouldn't be surprised. They don't have, even if he's not fully fit, if they don't really have another oh, option. Who is there? There's, they've, yeah. I think, you know, Richard, Richarlison's back, I think. I mean, he, he could start up front for them. But yeah, I, th I think they they need Calvert Lewin, and I think Benitez is going to look to unlock him. Um, so yeah, I, I don't I don't suddenly think Dean is 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 a bad pick, and I think you, you can take a bit too much stock in, in preseason stuff. They haven't really had a full squad to to contend with. So yeah, it's it's good that you've good that you've stayed loyal to to your man. Although you are saying if you need some money, you might you might drop him. <laughs> I think I mean I'm, I think one of the key things you're yeah, talking about any lessons to take into the season is yeah, sure have belief in you know what you what you assess to be the situation, what you think your team should be, but. Definitely be flexible. People mm. talk about running away from picks. I'd rather describe it as, you know, being flexible because sometimes a pick could really work and then you should still leave it alone because something better comes up. Mm. So while I'm pretty happy with this team, if it's completely different on Friday, I'll be happy with that as well. Yep. Uh, so talk about midfield. So obviously no Fernandez in this draft, which is the major thing. It means you've been able to invest quite heavily uh, in Son and Mares. Um, you've got Rafinha on your bench, but not none of the likes of like Barnes or uh, Smith Rowe or all these kind of guys. You, you, you've got a you know, a, a fairly pricey midfield there. So you've, you've used the Fernandez funds well. Um, what are your feelings about Son and Mares? You think they're the they're, they're cover, they're cover? I don't want really to use the word cover, but, you know, are, are you thinking of captaining Salah every week or do you think you might take a bit of a punt on one of those two? So that, that's possibly why I'm preferring the non-Fernandez mm. team at the moment. And I mean, if, if we knew Sancho was going to start, I quite like that and I might end up with him. Um, it feels like quite a nice halfway house. Like he, I'm not saying he's going to do a Salah, but if you look at his numbers, look at the type of player he is, watched him in Bundesliga, 
he might not be a million miles off when Salah joining, just in terms of the magnitudes of impact he could have. Mm. You know, he has a lot of potential. He's more of a creator than a goal scorer, maybe like Salah, although Salah was more of a creator over at Roma. So I don't think he's going to get 300 points, but you know, he has to get 200 to be a very good pick. Mm. So I like that in the sort of medium term. So in the short term, it kind of came down to Fernandez, Greenwood, maybe a striker. But looking at the captain options, I don't know if I would captain Fernandez outside of, is it game week three where everyone's looking yeah, at him? Yeah, Liverpool got Chelsea in three and Fernandez has got Wolves away. Yeah, absolutely. But I think with Son has Watford in game week three. Yep. So I'd be very happy that I think Watford, unfortunately, are not good. We'll see. <laughs> uh, and then the other one, I think people were looking at, was it game week four? But Salah's got Leeds away. And I know I'm a Leeds fan, but Salah Leeds away sounds very good to me. Yeah, People are overestimating our defence. It, it kind of looked better at the end of last year. And I think we're maybe putting too much stock in the fact that we kept a few, few clean sheets. We kept City to one goal. But in the last 10 games, very roughly off the top of my head, we conceded 10 more XG than actual goals. So like one goal a game. Mm. That does not sound sustainable to me. We effectively didn't actually improve defensively. We just got lucky. Just got lucky, yeah. So I'm not saying we're going to fall apart or anything, but captaining Salah against Leeds, you would have done it this time last year. And I don't think we're all that different. So surely there's a big worry there with Fernandes in this week because he's he's playing Leeds. I mean, I guess I guess the, the, the risk of it is is minimalise a little bit because Salah is going to be so heavily backed for the captaincy. So, you yeah. know, there's there's that there's, there's always a worry that, you know, a big Fernandez Hall would, would still hurt you with this team, but at least it won't be, you know, 200% EO or, yeah, or whatever. I mean, that's, that's, that's a really good point, right? If I if I think Leeds are a good fixture, I should have Fernandez. I think it just comes down to, I would probably still prefer Salah for this week. And therefore, when am I going to captain Fernandez? Mm. Still a brilliant pick, we'll get to on the points. But if you're not going to captain a premium, I'm not sure you're getting the most utility out of them. So at least for these first few weeks, I like the idea with this team, at least, you know, I, I have a Fernandez draft, but with this team, at least, I like the idea of trying to eat those points out of Mares, who I think is probably pretty nailed in the first few mm. weeks and then could easily move to a Chelsea player or whether that's Lukaku by putting funds elsewhere or say a Havertz, who's probably less attractive now. I like the idea of Mason Mount a lot in the long term. Yep. He's got a you know, new World Cup striker to supply. He was one of the best, best underperformers, if that works, at XGI last season. He had one of the biggest differences. I quite like those players. You know, there's a there's a lot of ground to be made up, if you like. Uh, we'll get onto the forward line, but those players are based on that. And then Son, we'll see what happens with Kane. He could go either way. In seasons past, Son was better without Kane because he would move up front. Last year, he was better with Kane because of their ridiculous relationship. Hmm. But then at the end of the season, he got shifted wide. With a new manager, we guess he's, he's going to play up front, especially if Kane isn't available. I'd say if Kane come back, comes back into the team, Son probably becomes a better option provided Harry Kane is interested in playing. Mm. If Kane leaves, he probably becomes slightly worse but then becomes their talisman. So I kind of like the outcomes there. And if it does all go wrong, it's not too hard to move a £10 million player on. Yeah, I, I, I actually think he's the talisman, whatever happens. I think you know him signing the new contract is such a statement from him about his belief and love for the club. And I think Harry has got quite a long way to go to... To kind of bring you know get get some of the faith back and, and restored, I think it's it's very very obvious to everyone on the outside that he wants that move and he's done with Spurs yeah. and it's going to be a hell of a backtrack now if if City don't pay up the money and how's yeah. how's Kane going to approach it? Re really interesting and uh, the fact it's City Spurs on the first day of the season as well is just I know, that's, that's always very good isn't incredible it? isn't it incredible script <laughs> yeah I mean what I really like about this team is that is that you've you've used the Fernandez money well you you've spread it around your side really nicely you've got good good defense you've got three strong midfielders and then you've got three good strikers up front as well i guess the issue is when you when or if you want to move for premiums you're going to find it really hard because you're going to you've got you've got yep. money every, all over the squad so it's yep. if you decide you want lukaku or de bruyne comes back and you want him or you want your kane moves and you decide you're going to need him it's, it's going to be a wild card with this team i would imagine i, I just think you're going to find it maybe too hard. so maybe the thing that makes me kind of comfortable with this is I am super down for taking like a minus eight real early. Okay. I, th I think we all get very focused on our game week squad, one squad, as we absolutely should. And of course, the start is important. Do we? I, because... I, I, resent, I resent that. <laughs> Barely looked at it. <laughs> yes, not like we're doing a video on it. It's fine. <laughs> um, but and of course, it's important, right? A good start can't possibly be a bad thing. And typically, people who finish high look back at their game week one squad and went, oh, I got it right. But I'd argue that... That's only the people who then continue to get it right. Mm. And it's possibly even more important, unless you completely ruin your game week one team, is to how you then react in two, three, four, five to the new information we're getting. A lot of people use a wildcard for that. 
if we're getting a more traditional season, I think the best double for our second wild card is going to be about game week 35 or something. I don't like the idea of going 30 weeks, if not more, without a wild card. So if I could hold it, even if, you know, game week seven is, I know a lot of people are looking at fixture swings. So if I have to use it, then fine. But I quite like the idea of being aggressive with transfers, trying to get on things early and giving myself the absolute maximum amount of time to make it up. We often see people happy to take hits towards the end of a season because, you know, whether they go, oh, I'm going to finish wherever, so it doesn't matter. Or maybe they're chasing a high rank and they go into an aggressive mode. But that gives you the minimum amount of time for it to pay off. Mm. If you take a minus eight, a minus 12 in, you know, the first few weeks, you've got the whole season to recover those points. Now, I'm not saying you should do that. It still has to be a careful and calculated move. But I think it has a better upside now than it does later. So yeah. I quite like to do that and try and get, you know, try and get that team that I'm happy with till Christmas in the first few weeks, as opposed to having to wildcard in it and then not having a wildcard. The, 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 the first wildcard is horrible. The first wildcard is, 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 I find it so stressful because in some ways you want to use it early because, you know, you, you have players who emerge quickly and their prices go up and you want to react and, and be aggressive. In other ways, you want to do exactly what you're doing. You want to save it and plan and use it strategically to target fixtures or, or runs like that. I find it very difficult. And I always end up using it pretty early because my team, especially for the last three years, has been rubbish. So I've had to I've had to play it. But it would be nice to be in a position where I could use it, you know, for, for you know, I'm doing OK and I see a potential to, to actually make a bit of a leap up rather than doing it from like, you know, crawling on my hands and knees, like trying to get over the finish line. And it's about game week four is how, is how, I, is how I sometimes feel. Uh, That's always the way, isn't it? Because oh, we get so st- stuck in this mindset as well of, you know, we spend all summer tweaking with our teams and we're so used to being able to do whatever we want. I don't know about you, but I spend the first few weeks of the season on the transfer tab, making about 10 transfers, yeah. looking at other teams I could have had. And then I go, oh, well, I could wildcard into that team. So it's a, it's a slippery slope. Yeah, have you, have you, I don't know if you saw Black Box last night, but Mark was talking about Ragabolly's new new tool, which is which is called like yeah. a kind of what if a thing, and you can put in teams yeah. and variations. So you can put in your three teams that you've, you're thinking about, and you'll be able to My talk team. to yourself in six <laughs> weeks' time by seeing how high you could have been. Um, I'm gonna, good, good, good lessons. Yeah, it's cool. I'm, I'm Hopefully. Gonna, <laughs> yeah, well, or painful lessons, I imagine. <laughs> I'm going to set up a, a bench boost team because I I I really am tempted by by a game with one bench boost more more so than I have been before i think because we've got these four million options in defense i don't think it's a completely stupid strategy and especially when you're thinking about the wild card it means you can not have to focus on building a team full of of, of you know of players you could you can you can wild card yeah. into a team with with non-starters and of a four million goalkeeper and a four million defender and not have to worry about it so yeah it's, it's something that's that, that's, that's really interesting actually i guess i would normally say my instinct is to say that's a bad idea because you want to use the bench boost when say there's a double so there's maximum mm. upside but the fact that we've got these cheap options that we're probably not going to keep all season maybe balances that out. Because normally at this stage of the season, you'd either have a non-playing defender or a defender who you wouldn't expect yeah. any points from. I could probably build a bench that I would hope for 15 points, maybe other than the goalkeeper. Well, I've, 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 I, I think, I think some... for example, say say you found 0.5 and you did steal to a 4-5 goalkeeper, you know, Foster or Backman, not Foster, Backman, sorry. Yeah. You know, you you be you could be doing a, a bench boost with Batman, Rafina, Ramity, and Brownhill, and it's not awful, right? It's not it's not completely awful. And well, even even going with Ramity to like you know a Ben White or something. Yeah, then exactly. I guess the only thing is you're holding on to those players for a bit of time. But yeah, maybe you could. But the, the, this is what I like about the four million defenders because because I think Amity yeah. and, and Simakas are both going to play. So at least yeah. you know you, you're kind of maximising their potential really from the from the first week. Anyway, just yeah, a there's, thought. There's definitely an opportunity there. Just an opportunity. Yeah, I I, I, I want to see some people do it and and let me know how it goes <laughs> rather than me do it myself. Um, so finally, <laughs> nice, uh, nice. Yeah, exactly. I know it's a bit bit of a cop out. <laughs> um, up front, so we won't go into too much detail about Antonio. He's been in every draft I've ever seen. I've, I've I can't believe his ownership so low. He's it seems to be in every in everyone's squad. Um, Wilson's an interesting one. Uh, I mean, you're a stats man. Um, I'm guessing there's some there's some stats behind Wilson. I mean, he's that he's the kind of player, isn't he? Like focal point of the team. He's, he's going to score pretty much all the goals. He's an he's an irritant for clean sheets. You know, they could be. I will never forget that game against Spurs when Spurs were just so incredibly dominant against Newcastle and they just couldn't score. And then what was it? Like 93rd minute or something, a, a dodgy handball claim. I think Dyer had his hand behind his back and it and it hit him. And who steps up? Callum Wilson slots in. He's a, yeah, he's, he's just that kind of guy, isn't he? He gets points. In a in a in another universe where he's not injury prone, he is the player Chelsea just signed yeah. playing up front. Yeah. He I mean, yeah, well, like you, say, you mentioned that. Antonio, but he he's similar to Antonio in terms of I don't mean on the injury front, not even necessarily type of player. But when looking at the numbers, I've got a minutes per XGI, so minutes per expected goal involvement here from the Scout website from the members area. 
And it's really nice at this time of season because the reason I like sorting it by minutes per XGI as opposed to just raw XGI is, sure, Wilson and Antonio may well get injured. You know, Jota won't play every single minute. But right now, while we're trying to work out, you know, value and if we know someone's going to play, so Wilson is fit, he's going to start up front. Mm. He's right up there. He is only just behind Diogo Jota. He's only just behind Mane, although from last season where Mane was poorer. He's not that far off Kane. Kane had 129.3 minutes per XGI last year. Callum Wilson had 149.6. That, for example, is just ahead of Bamford. It's ahead of Sterling. It's ahead of Calvert-Lewin. It's ahead of you know, Martial's down there, Firmino, who aren't as good, but he's thoroughly ahead of them yeah. and cheaper or you know, a better option, we think, for our team. And the best at the top are Salah and Fernandez, obviously, with your 116 and 120. Then you get into your Vardy's, Ian Acho's, who are very similar, interestingly. Antonio's there, De Bruyne's there. But just behind them is but he's, he's, so he's with the he's elite fit, crowd. I want him. Yeah, he's, yeah. With, he's, with, he's with the elite crowd. And he's always a player that I fear. Because I just know he just needs one chance. He just needs one one mishap, one misstep, and he and he score. And he's so good at that. And he's like I think we have these players that we think of a bit of as, as trolls. And I think Wilson is is that because I've owned him. I've owned him in the past when he's had a good fixture run and he's done nothing. But he just seems to always get something in, in, against teams that you don't really want him to. You know, maybe you've got a defender and not him, and he scores one in that. And yeah, I, I think he's an absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant player. And I think this this. His partnership with St. Maximan is really interesting um, as well. Maybe Fraser can come back into consideration too this year because, I mean, they had an incredible, incredible relationship uh, at Bournemouth. So, yeah, interesting to see how Wilson gets on. I'm, I'm pleased to see someone going from from the start. I think he could I think he could do really well for you. Uh, the final player is Watkins. Now, Watkins is an interesting one because a bit like Dean, it's almost like this this team is kind of about from about six weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> I've been super busy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a completely negative way. It's just a lot of these players, I think people have have had a bit of an eye for then kind of gone off. But the fact Simicast is there shows that it has been updated uh, fairly recently. What's your feeling behind Watkins then? Has, has the Dean Smith comments recently about saying he's going to be partnered with Ings kind of put you back towards him maybe? So if I'm 100% honest, if I had 0.5, that would probably be in because yeah. it just feels like the more straightforward pick. Even if you know Watkins ends up being better, I think Ings, uh, Ings probably is the better option from the start. But I don't have that, that 0.5. And I don't think the difference is going to be that horrible. Watkins had better numbers than Ings last year, uh, even per minute. Of course, Watkins are going to be played for the better side and now Ings is in that side. Now he's become the main man. So those numbers aren't maybe entirely useful for this season. But I don't think like Dan Ings is going to go and score 20 goals and Watkins gets five. Yeah. Like it may, you know, if they go and get 20, he might get 15 or they might assist each other or whatever. So unless we see something in the opening weeks that really looks like it's no longer Ollie Watkins' side, I think there are points there. And when Grealish was missing last year, Watkins did start shifting out to the left. We know he does that. But if he's going to start up front, he's already got experience kind of playing that role. And he provided quite a lot of goals. So mm. if Dan Ings is going to score goals, he's going to provide them. Sure, Leon Bailey, Ben Wendy, if they're fit. If Wendy was fit, I'd probably consider him for the team as well. But Watkins could well be the one providing the goals for Dan mm. Ings. And when you're up front, that's only a one point difference. Yeah, I mean Watkins has had a bit of the injury scare over over pre season, but it looks like he's he's going to come back into the team. I guess the thing with Watkins is you know you're going to get ninety from him, and Ings is yeah. is you know. I'm a, I'm a bit concerned having got him in my own side that he's going to be a player who's probably sub quite his minutes will probably be managed um, but early on hopefully he's the injury problems are behind and it but you never know interestingly we're not sure if he's on penalties because I mean it depends if El Ghazi plays I know he probably won't be first choice but in a pre-season friendly where they were both on the pitch I think El Ghazi took yeah, the penalty did. yeah so I think if Ing- he plays I think, Ings, I think Ings will take them when, when El Ghazi isn't playing but yeah, yeah, it's 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 just if if you if you had Ings over Watkins, you would have the most injury prone front three <laughs> in football with a bench in a few weeks of Simakas and Amity. So, I actually think if I were you, I wouldn't be trying to find that naught five, and I'd probably stick with Watkins. And I think what you said is 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 pretty good. <laughs> if, if if I if I did go with this team, I could see myself having like say a six point five seven point five midfielder instead of Watkins. Mm. I think that's a pretty fluid position. But I just generally really like. I know our striker options have got a bit smaller the last couple of weeks. But that sort of 6.5 to 8 million bracket seems absolutely ripe for points to yep. the point where Lukaku and Kane almost feel tough to get in because they're so much more expensive. Of mm. course, you'd captain them or I may as well captain these players very much. But I'm almost more interested in trying to find the Mason Mount who will supply Lukaku so I can maintain these sort of 7.5, 8 million pound strikers. Yep, absolutely agree. Seb, 
awesome. I like the team a lot. I wish you luck deciding between your three different <laughs> your three different drafts. <laughs> Uh, I wonder if you'll end up going for Fernandez after all, after all your talk. But yeah, I think ah. I, I think there's some I think there's some solid pieces. Whenever I hear anyone say they're not going to go for Fernandez, I'm going to be looking at their teams and being ah. like, "You're all all fart no poo." That's the that's the saying that I like. To, to... <laughs> and it's it's absolutely fair enough. He's a brilliant player, <laughs> and we know you know if effective ownership is your thing, we know it'll hurt if he scores. I guess here as well, I've made the decision to go without Man United attack altogether. Yeah, because that kind of just feels a bit like oh, I don't have Fernandez, but I have Greenwood. It's like, well, there are other better players better than Greenwood. Mm. You're just trying to get some Man United attack. If you're going to commit, commit to it. Yep, I agree. And you could always, you know, lose Mares for for Sancho or or, or Son, or you you know, you've got ways of tapping into that that attack if you want to. Um, that's amazing. So just a final plug for the Fantasy Football Scout uh, membership. If you're listening to this video, you must have some interest in FPL, and Fantasy Scout has got loads of great tools that can help you with your season. You won't have long now to sign up and look at the season ticker, to look at the comparison tools, stats tables, rate my team, all this stuff. Uh, and it's the last day of the discount as well. So make sure you check into that and see. If you like listening to Seb, which I'm sure you will have done, uh, he is on the Scoutcast every Tuesday night live with Joe and Andy. And there was the first one uh, this week. So check that out if you haven't already. But Seb, thank you so much for joining me and I will speak to you soon.